हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट एंड यू वॉचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा It's 26th January, a very special day for us. On this day last year, we brought you the first episode of Vantage. Honestly, it felt like a physics board exam. We passed all thanks to you. Today is also India's 75th Republic Day. If you live in a housing society in India, I can imagine how your day begins with songs from movies like Border and Karma playing on loudspeakers every year. It makes you wonder why Bollywood is not adding to the playlist. There's a fluttering tr tricolor everywhere you see. Soon, the parade on Kartavya Path begins. You see a resplendent display of India's culture and military might. The vibe is infectious. For me, the most moving moment was the sight of women leading the motorcycle stunts. They came from all parts of the country, small towns and villages, conquering physical, social and cultural barriers to put up this spellbinding show. It gives you goosebumps. I'm sure today's parade inspired many young girls and boys all over India. We'll bring you the highlights. Also the takeaways from the Modi Macron bilateral. What message does a Padma award to the Foxconn chairman give? Why Tesla has lost 80 billion dollars in one day in its valuation? Why Pakistan is accusing India of assassinations? Why Australia is seeing protests on its national day? How Netflix is betting big on sports content and how the tradition of military parades began. All this and more coming up the headlines first. Set back for Kenyan President William Ruto a court blocks his government's decision to deploy police to Haiti calls the move illegal and unconstitutional 1000 police officers were to lead a UN approved mission to control gang violence in Haiti Mali's junta ends the 2015 peace deal with separatists it was seen as essential in maintaining stability in the country the junta blamed the rebels as well as Algeria the lead mediator for its decision since 2012 Mali has been a victim of jihadist violence In India the opposition is the opposition unraveling just months before the election. Reports claim Bihar Chief Minister Nitish Kumar will leave the India bloc. Speculation is rife that Kumar will return to the ruling India the ruling NDA coalition on Sunday. He could be sworn in as the Chief Minister of Bihar again with the BJP support. Polls underway in the Pacific island nation of Tuvalu. The election comes amid the US and China wrangling for influence in the region. Tuvalu is one of only 12 countries that have diplomatic relations with Taiwan. Colombia seeks international aid to fight forest fires for the fourth day now. Hundreds of firefighters have been trying to control it. The blaze has blanketed the capital in smoke. Some schools have been closed and many flights disrupted in Bogota. And Yannick Sinner upsets Novak Djokovic at the Australian Open. 22-year-old Sinner beat the 10-time Australian Open champion in four sets. This is Djokovic's first loss in the tournament since day in new delhi most residents woke up to a dense blanket of fog but things soon warmed up all thanks to the spirit of 1.4 billion indians after all it is republic day today not even the cold and fog can keep us down as you know republic day is steeped in tradition when it starts how it starts what happens when everything has been decided based on decades of tradition and today was no different It started at the National War Memorial. Prime Minister Modi paid his respects to India's brave hearts. He was joined by the three service chiefs. Then 
focus shifted to Karta Vipat. It was time for the parade. I'm sure most of you watched it live in the morning. But if not, do not worry. We've got you covered. Let's look at the top 10 highlights from this year's parade. French President Emmanuel Macron was the chief guest. His arrival was a break from recent tradition. Normally, the chief guest and the Indian president arrive in limousines. But this time, a horse-drawn carriage was used. Both presidents rode together from Rashtrapati Bhavan. Take a look at this. President Macron and President Murmu using the traditional Indian greeting. Some trivia now. The horse-drawn carriage was last used in 1984. Later that year, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was assassinated, so the carriage was dropped. It was considered a security issue. But almost 40 years later, it's back. Once Macron and President Murmu arrived, the parade kicked off. First was the national anthem, then a 21-gun salute, and finally, a shower of flower petals. Four helicopters dropped them over the crowd. Next up was the band. 112 women walked down Kartavipath. They played Indian tribal and folk instruments, like the Nagara, Dhol, and Rag Revati. It was the first all-women band to lead this parade. Then came the military. A contingent from France was part of this parade. 95 marching members and 33 band members. They belong to the French Legion. It was established way back in 1831. Today, the Legion has more than 9,500 officers and soldiers. They come from 140 nationalities. A French air team was also in New Delhi. One Airbus tanker flew over Kartavipat. It was flanked by two French Rafale jets. Last year, the reverse happened. Prime Minister Modi was chief guest on the French National Day. So an Indian contingent marched in Paris. Today, a French contingent marched in New Delhi. It tells you about the cooperation. Next up was Indian regiments. Some of them are household names by now, like the Madras Regiment, or the Rajputana Rifles, or the Sikh Regiment. All of them were in top form, their fleet moving in perfect harmony. The white gloves rising and falling together. It really is a sight to behold. But today, one marching group stood out. An all-women tri-service group. Again, it was a first for India's Republic Day. Women troops were drawn from all three services, the Army, the Navy and the Air Force. Strength. Discipline, the dedication of women officers, and unwavering commitment. Every Republic Day parade is built around themes. One of the themes this year was Nari Shakti, meaning the power of women. We saw that with the band. We also saw that with the tri-service contingent. But there was more lined up. A daring display of motorcycle stunts. 265 women were part of this routine. They were drawn from India's paramilitary groups like the CRPF and the BSF. Their stunts depicted the importance of Indian values. Yoga too was featured. Take a look. You'll agree that the choreography requires innumerable hours of practice and exacting standards. And as thrilling as it is to see the sport, we must also warn our viewers not to try this or attempt any of these maneuvers on our roads. Please remember that they are professional riders. So that was the military might. But what's a Republic Day without culture? On 26th January, Kartavya Path is not just a road, it becomes a canvas. All shades of Indian culture find representation on it. And today was no different. One highlight came from the culture ministry. A sari extravaganza. The sari, as you know, is a traditional Indian garment. It, com it comes in many styles, designs, weaves and materials. Every state, every region has a different one. So the culture ministry put on a show. It wasn't a rolling tableau. Instead, it was an installation. Around 1900 saris were on display, each of them from different corners of India. But don't worry, the rolling tableau did not disappear. There were 26 of them this year. 15 from Indian states, the rest from government organizations and ministries. 
We'll show you the best ones. The Indian Space Agency had one. Only seems fair after the year they had. The Isro Tablu featured their biggest achievements in 2023. Of course, Chandrayaan-3 was on it. So was a tribute to women scientists. The Electronics Ministry went for artificial intelligence. Their display had a giant robot in front. It highlighted the use of AI in education and healthcare. Then came the Ministry of External Affairs. Their tableau showed off the G20 logo. It also featured the Bharat Mandapam. That's where India hosted the G20 leaders last year. The sides of the tableau had more depictions, like India's global digital push and the millet programs. Finally, the states. Again, the focus was on culture and women empowerment. Take a look at our best picks. And now for the finale. The much-awaited fly-pass. The Indian Air Force put on a brilliant show. Around 54 aircraft were involved. You had Apache helicopters, the C-17 transport carrier, the Indian-made Tejas fighter jet, your MiGs and Sukhois, and of course, the Dasora Falls. The clouds did play spoil sport at times, but thankfully, we have onboard cameras now, so the pictures are stunning. With that, another parade came to an end. It's the perfect way to celebrate this great country. A bit of culture, a bit of military and might, a bit of science and technology. But in the end, the same idea, the same unwavering belief in a young country with an old civilization. We say happy Republic Day to all of you. So that was today's celebration. Throughout the parade, you could see Prime Minister Modi and President Macron talking. Yesterday, we told you about their roadshow in Jaipur. It was followed by a bilateral meeting. A lot of issues were on the agenda. The two sides are working on what they call Horizon 2047, a new roadmap for the India-France relationship. It was signed last year. And this is like a plan for the next 25 years. And this plan shaped the scope of the bilateral talks. The focus was on three issues, defense, space, and trade. You already know about the defense relationship. India's traditional supplier has been Russia. It still remains our biggest supplier. But over the past few years, India has tried to diversify and France has emerged as the second largest supplier. France accounts for 29% of India's defense imports. The US comes third at 11%. Now, both New Delhi and Paris want to build on this. They want to go beyond selling weapons and holding military drills. They want to jointly build defense capabilities meaning develop and build weapons together. This collaboration is driven by shared interests and mutual concerns, mainly in the Indo-Pacific. Both India and France are wary of China's growing influence and its efforts to control key shipping lanes. So they're working in tandem and deepening cooperation. From India's perspective, there are two acquisitions on the horizon. The first is the Rafals. India wants 26 Rafale marine jets, better known as the Rafale M. India wants warplanes which can operate from the Navy's aircraft carriers. We have two such carriers, the INS Vikramaditya and the INS Vikrant. The choice of planes was between the French Rafales and the American FA-18 Super Hornets. The Indian Navy chose the Rafales. India is also buying French submarines. Three Scorpion-class conventional submarines. The Navy already has six of these. They're buying three more. And both these deals mark a noteworthy shift, a significantly higher Make in India component. The details are not final yet, but New Delhi is pushing for greater indigenization and more technology transfer. And the French seem to be on board. So it's believed to be only a matter of time before they sign on the dotted line. Next, we have space. On this front, we have a deal. It's between New Space India and France's Arian E Space. Together, they launch more satellites. And finally, we have trade. Macron is traveling with a large business delegation from sectors like pharmaceuticals, aeronautics, automobiles, and energy. These business leaders are in India. Bilateral trade is at an all-time high. It crossed $13 billion in the last financial year. 
Clearly, there is momentum, and both sides are looking to capitalize on it. New deals have been signed. The most significant one was between Airbus and Tata, a commercial helicopter deal. Airbus was, will build a manufacturing facility in India and Tata will oversee the production. That is the deal. Again, the focus is on indigenization and joint production. So in terms of actual outcomes, the announcements may seem modest. But this is work in progress. India and France are focusing on the long term. And in that context, Macron's visit gives the relationship a boost before India enters the election season. India's Republic Day is all about traditions, and one of them is the Padma Awards. The winners are usually announced on the 20, 25th of January, on the eve of the Republic Day. And this year, there are 132 winners. Among them is this man, Liu Yang, a Taiwanese national, also the chairman and CEO of Foxconn. Liu has been awarded the Padma Bhushan. It is the third highest civilian honor in India. Above it, are the Padma Vibhushan and the Bharat Ratna. Now, why is this important? For a couple of reasons. No Taiwanese national has received a Padma award before this. Liu is the first. And what does it tell you? Well, broadly speaking, two things. Number one, India is sending a message to China. Beijing, as you know, considers Taiwan to be theirs, sort of like a breakaway island. On paper, India also recognizes this. We follow the one China policy and that one China is Beijing. That's India's official position. But recently, New Delhi has been diluting that policy. Look at trade, for instance. It was just $1 billion in 2001. Now it is more than $7 billion, trade between India and Taiwan. Last year, Taiwan, Taiwan opened a new office in Mumbai. They're third in India. Taipei also hosted three very important guests last year. Former Army Chief Manoj Naravne, former Navy Chief Karambir Singh, and former Air Force Chief RKS Baduria. So relations have been growing, and now India is openly acknowledging that. Foxconn is headquartered in Taiwan. It's one of the largest electronics manufacturers in the world, also the top maker of iPhones. So the company is like a crown jewel for Taiwan. Giving their CEO the Padma Bhushan is a political message, a message that China won't like. Secondly, it's a business pitch. Right now, most of Foxconn's revenue comes from China, but the company is looking to diversify. They're investing $1.6 billion in India. The idea is to shift some of the production here to India. And we have seen indications of that. A Foxconn factory was set up in 2019. It produces iPhones 14 and 15. In fact, the Indian-made 15 model released alongside the Chinese one last year. But India will want more. Prime Minister Modi wants India to become a semiconductor hub, and for that, Taiwan is key. The world's biggest chip foundry is based in Taiwan. It's called the TSMC. Foxconn, too, has stakes in the sector. They were initially part of a joint venture with India's Vedanta Group. It was a $20 billion plan. Unfortunately, it was called off. So India wants closer ties with Taiwan, with Taiwanese businesses. Hence the Padma Bhushan for Liu Yang. It's a neat policy using civilian awards for global outreach. And countries do it all the time. Prime Minister Modi himself is an example of that. He has received civilian awards from multiple countries, like Saudi Arabia, Russia, the UAE, and France. And now India is doing the same. And it's not just for foreign outreach, it's also domestic. The Padma Awards are no longer just about the big stars. They're also about unsung heroes. Let me introduce some of them. Parbati Barua, India's first woman Mahout. She's been awarded the Padma Shri. Jageshwar Yadav, a social worker dedicated to tribal welfare. Chami Murmu, another tribal hero. She has planted 30 lakh trees and empowered 30,000 women. Gopi Swain, an artist who's been performing Krishna Leela for nine decades. Gurvinder Singh, a social worker dedicated to helping orphans and the specially abled. These are just a handful of names, but most Padmashree winners have similar stories. They have dedicated their lives to something bigger, whether it's social work or protecting the environment or preserving Indian culture or promoting art forms. You may not have heard of these people, but their work is priceless. It's a welcome change to the Padma Awards. Many now call it the People's Padma. 
And we say it's a good change because civilian awards should go beyond rewarding fame. They should also be about recognizing service. They say rising to the top is easy, but staying there is hard. Just ask Tesla. For its loyal fans, Tesla shares were like gold. But this month has been painful for them. The Tesla stock has plunged and how? Yesterday, it fell by over 12% and it wiped out over $80 billion in value. 80 billion shaved in a single day. At the end of 2023, Tesla was worth almost $790 billion. Today, it is valued at $580 billion. It's still a lot of money. But when you lose $210 billion in less than a month, you should be worried. And that's what Tesla has lost. It is among the world's most valuable companies. So why is it bleeding money? The short answer is Elon Musk. The founder whose vision took Tesla to such heights is also being blamed for its losses. He's a mercurial entrepreneur. This month, he delivered some bad news. He said Tesla is cutting prices. They'll sell cheaper cars, but it won't boost sales. Elon Musk said he expects a slowdown. So they'll sell fewer cars for lesser money. The numbers show this trajectory. Sales are sluggish and profit margins are down. Earlier, they were at 16%. Now they're reduced by half. Tesla's new profit margin is around 8%, and the competition is intense. Musk has admitted that the Chinese are challenging Tesla's dominance. He wants tougher trade barriers to offset this. Elon Musk has a message for his investors. It says, and I'm quoting, Chinese competitors will pretty much demolish most other car companies in the world unless the government puts, puts in place tougher trade barriers. And he has a point when he says this. The Chinese joined the EV race late, but they've quickly captured the market. By the end of 2023, BYD had dethroned Tesla. It became the world's biggest EV maker. BYD, as you would know, is a Chinese company. Last year, it sold more cars than Tesla, and that's a problem for Elon Musk. But that's not his only problem. For the longest time, Tesla had the first mover's advantage. They made the coolest electric cars. They were the innovators and the only game in town. But that's not the case anymore. There are other electric car makers. They're challenging Tesla's domination. And the company is trying to catch up. Also, Tesla's services are falling short of expectations. I'll tell you what happened last week. Tesla owners in Chicago had a rough time. The harsh winter broke their charging stations. So charging a car took much longer. If it took 45 minutes in the past, now it was taking up to two hours. Plus, the batteries are proving to be a problem. They were draining quickly. The result of all of this is predictable. Tesla is losing customers. Some of you may have heard about Hertz. It's a major car rental company. It is getting rid of its Tesla cars. It has put over 600 Teslas up for sale. These cars were part of the Hertz fleet, but now they're being dumped. They're being sold at a 39% discount. And to add insult to injury, Hertz will now replace these Teslas with gasoline-powered cars. Basically, the company is reducing its electric car fleet. What does that mean for Tesla? The market is more challenging. I'll give you one more reason why. There are fewer tax breaks available. Earlier, if you bought a Tesla, any Tesla, you could avail a tax concession. But now the rules have changed. Now only five Tesla models are eligible. And as more electric cars enter the market, they'll get a smaller slice of this shrinking pie. So I come back to the question, where does that leave Tesla? In a spot of bother. It will have to fight to stay relevant, rethink its business model and make a pivot. Elon Musk is already at it. He's promising a new Tesla, a low cost model, something in the range of $25,000. But they're not launching it anytime soon. They're looking at a 2025 rollout. Until then, Tesla will have to fight for every inch of the market. It's an uphill road to recovery. Thankfully for Elon Musk, it won't hurt his personal brand. Tesla's decline has not been able to dent his fan base. His supporters still believe in him. His comments on X still go viral. His fans are confident that Musk can still break the market with new products. But this crisis at Tesla will test Elon Musk's business acumen. There's a new flashpoint between India and Pakistan. Not a fight at the border, though. This one is more diplomatic. Pakistan is accusing India of assassinating its citizens. Two men were killed in two different cities. Islamabad says India did it. 
Does the claim sound familiar? It should, because that's exactly what Canada's Justin Trudeau did. First, listen to the claim. We have credible evidence of the links between Indian agents and the assassination of two Pakistani nationals on Pakistani soil. These are killings for hire cases involving a sophisticated international setup spread over multiple jurisdictions. Indian agents use technology and safe havens on foreign soil to commit assassinations in Pakistan. They recruited, financed and supported criminals, terrorists and unsuspecting civilians to play defined roles in these assassinations. I know you have a lot of questions, so let's break it down. The two men were killed last year. One in Sialkot, his name was Shahid Latif, a jaish e mohammed terrorist. He masterminded the 2016 Pathan Court attack. The second killing was in Rawal Court. A Lashkar terrorist was gunned down in a mosque. His name was Mohammad Riaz. Both men were bona fide terrorists. Now Islamabad says India plotted their death. And how did India do that? Well, the details are sketchy. Pakistan says an Indian agent in a third country planned the whole thing. Apparently, he recruited assassins, sent them to Pakistan, and then took out the targets. And how has India reacted to this charge? With disdain. New Delhi's statement uses some very harsh words. Listen to this. It is Pakistan's latest attempt at peddling false and malicious anti-India propaganda. India and many other countries have publicly warned Pakistan, cautioning that it would be consumed by its own culture of terror and violence. Pakistan will reap what it sows. It's hard to argue with that. After all, Pakistan is not exactly Shangri-La. Multiple terror groups operate there. Some are aligned with the state, others fight the state. So assassinations are not unheard of. Prime ministers have been assassinated there. Former prime ministers have been assassinated. Governors and judges have been assassinated. So what's a terrorist? Nonetheless, Pakistan has made a charge. So let them prove their case. But I must say, the timing is suspect. Both killings happened last year. In September and October, Pakistan had months to investigate and make the charge. But when do they do it? On the 25th of January, on the eve of India's Republic Day, also their elections are around the corner. Pakistanis will vote on the 8th of February. So making this charge now raises eyebrows. It could be an attempt to discredit India or divert attention. We've seen two similar charges in the last six months. First from Justin Trudeau, then from the US Justice Department. Trudeau used the same words as Pakistan, credible evidence. We are yet to see it. We are yet to see Canada's so-called credible evidence. Let's see if Pakistan does any better. Such allegations could be part of a narrative building campaign. Let me explain. One country accusing you is an aberration. Two raises eyebrows, but the third forms a pattern. Is that what Pakistan is trying to do, to bill India as an irresponsible country, a country that kills people abroad? Their foreign secretary's statements reflect that attitude. They fit the pattern of similar cases which have come to light in other countries, including Canada and the United States. Clearly, the Indian network of extrajudicial and, and extraterritorial killings has become a global phenomenon. He says India's killings have become a global phenomenon. How about that? Pakistani terrorists fight in Afghanistan and Syria. Their deep state funds radicalism. Their military has, was neighbors with Osama bin Laden. Yet who do they accuse? India. And talk about priorities. Almost 40% of Pakistan's population is poor. Inflation is near 30%. But their focus is on dead terrorists. We don't know who killed them. But whoever did, did Pakistan a favor, we say. And fortunately, Islamabad doesn't see it that way. For them, two upright citizens have been killed. It will be interesting to see how this story develops, especially in the context of elections. We heard Nawaz Sharif talk about a reset with India. Is this the army's way of saying, don't even think about it? It could be. And that's the unfortunate reality of being Pakistan's neighbor. We've been telling you about the Red Sea crisis, how Houthis based in Yemen have been attacking ships, how a US-led coalition has been striking them with missiles, and how all of this has been hurting global trade. This has been going on for more than a month. What will it take to stop the Houthis? Can China do it? 
I'll tell you why I ask. The Red Sea trade disruption affects everyone, but especially China, because China greatly benefits from the Red Sea trade to Europe. And now it is feeling the pinch, like everyone else, which explains a new report doing the rounds. China is apparently trying to get the Houthis to back down. Our next report tells you how. The situation in the Red Sea has escalated sharply recently, and China is deeply concerned about this. China calls for a halt to the harassment and attacks on civilian ships and for the maintenance of the smooth flow of global industrial and supply chains and the international trade order. That was China's foreign minister a few days ago. He called for a halt to the harassment and attacks on civilian ships. It was the most anti-Houthi stance China has publicly taken. But privately, it's another story. A new report is out. It says Beijing is applying pressure, trying to get the Red Sea attacks to stop. And this pressure isn't being applied directly on the Houthis. It's on their backers, Iran. Iran is widely known to support the Yemen-based Houthi group. It's one of the many Iranian proxies in West Asia. Iran calls its proxies the Axis of Resistance. This axis includes the Houthis in Yemen, Hamas in Gaza, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and various militias in Iraq and Syria. Iran is considered the leader of this anti-West, anti-Israel axis. Right now, the entire coalition is up in arms over Israel's actions against Hamas in Gaza. They are all acting in their own way to show solidarity with the Palestinians and to try and hurt Israel. The Houthis have taken to attacking ships in the Red Sea. The Red Sea is part of a major global trade route. Ships pass through it and enter the Mediterranean Sea via the Suez Canal. It's the most efficient way to transport goods from Asia to Europe. The Houthis say they are targeting ships bound for or affiliated with Israel. But their attacks have spooked almost every other ship as well. Freight rates are up, shipping insurance has spiked, and many vessels are avoiding the Red Sea route altogether. They are taking the longer route via the Cape of Good Hope of South Africa. This means that trade is becoming more expensive, which is a problem for major exporters like China. China wants global trade to go back to the way it was, and it is now reportedly asking Iran to rein in its proxy. Why would Tehran listen to Beijing? Because China is one of the few nations that engages directly with Iran. It reportedly bought 90% of Iran's crude oil exports last year. It sounds like a lot, but that wasn't much for the oil-guzzling nation. Iranian crude only contributed to 10% of China's crude imports, meaning it's an asymmetric relationship where China holds the leverage. It hopes to use that leverage to get Iran to stop the Houthis. But will this work? Because Iran is in a delicate situation. It can't publicly ask the Houthis to stop. It has a reputation to maintain as the leader of the axis of resistance. Iran's status would take a hit if anyone found out it bent under Chinese pressure. But that isn't the only dilemma. Iran also has an opportunity. The report says that Tehran is unhappy with the slow pace of Chinese investment in the country. China and Iran signed a 25-year cooperation agreement in 2021. But China has invested only $185 million in Iran since then. Compare this with the billions Beijing has vowed to invest in Saudi Arabia, Iran's one-time nemesis. It could try and get Beijing to open its coffers, in exchange for making the Houthis back down. Iran has a lot at stake. There's ample risk and reward in defying the dragon. We'll soon find out what path Tehran chooses to take. Coming back to Republic Day celebrations. India isn't the only former British colony that is celebrating today. On the other side of the world, it's Australia Day. It marks the day the British began colonizing Australia. January 26, 1788, a fleet of 11 ships docked in Sydney Harbour. They unfurled the Union Jack and began their conquest of Australia. The Australia of today was created by these colonizers, which is why the 26th of January is celebrated as Australia Day. Australia Day is our chance to pause and reflect on everything that we have achieved as a nation. Everything that we have created and built and learned through all the ups and downs of our history. There have been a lot of ups and downs in that history. Australia was not uninhabited before 1788. It was not an empty patch of land. It was already home to a number of people. 
the indigenous Australians, also known as Aboriginal Australians. For them, the British arrival marked the beginning of the end, an end to their First Nations, an end to their freedom, and for many, an end to their lives. For them, the 26th of January is a black day. The descendants of the indigenous people call it Invasion Day. For them, it's a day of mourning, not celebration. So every year on this day, they take to the streets in protest. And they're marching today as well in every major Australian city, demanding that the date of Australia Day be changed or that the holiday be abolished altogether. We have established here today to call for the government to abolish Australia Day. Um, there should be no such day that should be celebrated when land theft, murder and violence towards another human race should be celebrated. Indigenous Australians make up less than 4% of the country's population. They were systematically eradicated by the early colonisers. Many were later forcefully re-educated made to unlearn their culture and traditions. You can see why that would breed resentment and anger. Two acts of vandalism took place yesterday, the day before Invasion Day. They occurred in the city of Melbourne. Two statues were vandalized. One was of Captain James Cook, the famous British explorer who first mapped Australian shores. This was in 1770. His expedition made the colonization of Australia possible. That's why he had a statue. That statue of Cook was cut at the ankles and defaced. The other statue that was vandalized was of the British Queen Victoria, another symbol of colonization. Some Australians of European descent understand this anger. They've started marching alongside the indigenous Australians, asking that the date of Australia Day be changed. I think that should be up to the Aboriginal people to decide the date. Um, yeah, we don't care. It's, it's not what we are trying to call it now as white people. Um, it was an invasion, <laughs> whether you like it or not. Uh, and, and many people don't like that, including uh, people of European and other ethnic backgrounds. I think it's a total no-brainer. I don't know why we keep insisting on hanging on to this artificial date about a flag getting planted on a beach somewhere to, to mark the beginning of a prison. The Indigenous Australians have been gathering support. Every year, more people are joining these Invasion Day rallies, both Indigenous and of European descent. And politicians have been taking note. This was the famous Sydney Opera House today. Its iconic sails were lit up with pictures of Indigenous people from history. Other cities have been celebrating Indigenous people as well. Their flags have been hoisted. They're flying beside the Australian flag. It's a step in the right direction. And the next step should be changing the date of Australia Day because the 26th of January will always be tainted for these Australians. For them, it will always be Invasion Day. Streaming platforms are entering a new frontier, live sports. Take Netflix, for example. It has secured a $5 billion deal to exclusively live stream WWE, World Wrestling Entertainment's Raw. That is its flagship weekly wrestling show. It's a 10-year deal. More importantly, it is Netflix's first long-term bet on live sports. And others have done it before, like the IPL or the NFL. Now, Netflix has entered this arena. Live sports have always been a crowd puller, and OTT platforms can revolutionize them. They can change how we watch sports and where we watch. Will cable TV, then, lose out in this content war? Our next report tells you. Netflix has made a big bet. It has entered the ring with WWE or World Wrestling Entertainment. The streaming platform will broadcast its weekly hit show Raw. The deal is for 10 years and it's worth $5 billion. So the flagship WWE program will only broadcast on Netflix now. For those who don't know, WWE's Raw has been broadcasting on TV from 1993, so it's been a staple of cable TV for 31 years. Plus, it's a ratings blockbuster. It's currently the most watched show on the US network that broadcasts it. Last year, it crossed a billion dollars in annual sales. The three-hour show also has nostalgic value. It helped launch the careers of Dwayne The Rock Johnson, John Cena and Stone Cold Steve Austin. So Netflix getting the WWE deal is almost like a big coup and its first venture into the world of live sports. 
Of course, Netflix doesn't have to do much. WWE handles the in-house production of its show. So all Netflix does is broadcast it. Even then, it's symbolic. Because when Netflix came into the fray, its streaming playbook was simple. Original content, new shows and no live TV. Since then, it has moved away from that. And so have other streaming platforms. They're all venturing into the world of live sports. Take the IPL for example, the Indian Premier League. It's the world's biggest cricket league. The streaming rights sold for more money than the broadcasting rights. Viacom 18 owns the streaming rights. Amazon bet big on the NFL. $1 billion every year for 11 years. Apple TV owns the global rights for the US Major League Soccer. So it's not just Netflix. That's because live sporting events are a crowd puller. People always watch. And streaming platforms can revolutionize it. You missed a shot? You rewind. You want to see it from another angle? You change the view. You want to watch it on the go? Tune in on your phone. Plus, there can be lesser known leagues. Ones that don't attract money. Ones that people don't know about. You can watch them too. So live sports and streaming platforms are a match made in heaven. Yep. But the biggest loser here could be cable TV. And that's ironic. Because streaming platforms are replicating the same playbook. The cable TV playbook. Earlier, streaming platforms used to have just original content. Niche shows. Now they have licensed content, live events and reruns of popular shows. Now they're looking more like cable TV. And live sports could complete that switch. What is the most humane way of taking a human life? It's a tough question. America is debating it. They killed a man today, a death row prisoner. He was killed by nitrogen asphyxiation. The man was called Kenneth Smith. He was on death row for murder, committed three decades ago. This morning, he was executed by nitrogen gas. Simply put, he was deprived of oxygen. He could breathe only nitrogen, so he suffocated and died. This was done in Alabama. They believed it's a humane way, a humane method for the death penalty. But the United Nations does not agree. They say it's an untested method and it's, it amounts to torture. In 1982, the U.S. shifted to lethal injections. So why did they feel the need to change? Also, how many countries still use the death penalty? Our next report has the answers. On Thursday morning, Kenneth Smith had his last meal. It was eggs, steak and hash browns. Soon after, he was escorted to the execution room. Smith was tied to a gurney. He was made to wear a face mask. Minutes later, nitrogen gas was pumped into it. Smith struggled. He heaved back and forth. He was breathing heavy. He was writhing. He was pulling at the restraints. Nearly 22 minutes later, he was dead. What we saw was minutes of someone struggling for their life. We saw minutes of someone heaving back and forth. We saw spit. We saw all sorts of stuff from his mouth develop on the mask. We saw this mask tied to the gurney and him ripping his head forward over and over and over again. And we also saw Correction, of, correction officials in the room who were visibly surprised at how bad this thing went. Smith was convicted of murder in 1988. He was hired to kill the wife of a pastor. He's been on death row for three decades. Alabama has tried to execute him before. The state tried the go-to method, lethal injections, but it was called off at the last minute. Why? because authorities could not find his vein. Which brings us to the second attempt. It's new. It's never been tried before. In this, the inmate is deprived of oxygen until they only breathe nitrogen. It's basically choking to your own death. But that makes it controversial. It appeared that one Smith was holding his breath as long as he could. And then uh, there's also information out there of, uh, he struggled against his restraints a little bit, but there's some involuntary movement and some agonal breathing. So uh, that was all expected and is in the uh, side effects that we've seen or researched on nitrogen hypoxia. 
Alabama calls it the most painless and humane method. But the United Nations disagrees. It says the method is risky. It could lead to torture, or worse, non-fatal injuries. The UN says it's not been tested on humans. If the mask is not secured well, it could also leak. That could endanger the lives of others. The US introduced lethal injections in 1982. Since then, it's been the most common method of execution. The last US execution using gas was in 1999. Then they had used hydrogen cyanide gas. Which brings us to death penalties. 55 countries have it. 23 of them haven't used it for 10 years. Nine of these use it for only the worst of crimes. In 2022, at least 2,000 people were handed the death penalty. That year, global executions were also at a record high. 883 people are known to have been put to death, a 53% rise since 2021. These are the 11 countries that reportedly execute people. It includes the likes of China, the US, Saudi Arabia and Iran. In the US, there were 24 executions in 2023, six more than in 2022. Today, only 53% of Americans support the death penalty, the lowest level since 1972. So what methods do they use? Most countries choose hanging, lethal injections or death by shooting. Saudi Arabia is the only one with beheading. The nitrogen asphyxiation was a first for the world. Alabama may defend it, but the world is not convinced by this execution style dubbed the guinea pig method. And now let's turn our attention back to India. The nation is celebrating its 75th Republic Day. We told you all about it. But now let's talk about its most enduring symbol, the parade. It's a grand show of India's military might and its cultural diversity. Over the years, the parade has gotten bigger, longer and more colourful. But like we told you, it's still steeped in tradition. So how did the tradition of the military parade begin? The traces go all the way back to the Mesopotamian civilization. And today other nations, many other nations like Russia, China, France, North Korea, they all have their own military parades as well. But why do such celebrations include a parade at all? What is the historic link? Our next report tells you. India's Republic Day Parade. It holds a special place in every Indian's heart. And why won't it? The parade is a mark of national pride. It's a grand show of military might and of India's cultural diversity. But how did it all begin? Why do Republic Day celebrations include a parade at all? To answer this, let's go back in history to the Mesopotamian civilization. Mesopotamia was a historical region of West Asia. Accounts mention that the civilization held its own parades. It showcased strong displays of soldiers and weaponry, especially returning warrior kings who marched into the city amid public frenzy. The Romans had something similar. Victorious generals would lead processions into the capital, surrounded by crowds on all sides. And this explains the very purpose of military parades. They were a grand show of force. They put legacies of triumph on display and practically forged it into the minds of onlookers. Military parades were success stories and empires were so successful in fulfilling their goal of showmanship through parades that it gave way to nation-states. In the 19th century, military parades became Europe's national symbols. Prussia, which is modern-day Germany, was reportedly a pioneer of modern-day military parades. They created many formations that are popular even today. And they came up with the goose step in their parades. This is a special marching step that later became the symbol of the Nazi army. All of this can be traced back to Prussia. Now, this tradition of military parades has trickled down to modern nations. France holds a military parade on July 14th every year. They celebrate Bastille Day to commemorate the storming of the Bastille prison in 1789. It set off the French Revolution. Last year, India was the guest of honour to the French parade. 6,500 people marched. On display were 94 planes and helicopters, 219 ground vehicles, 200 horses and 86 dogs. Russia holds a parade on Victory Day. It takes place on May 9th every year to celebrate the 1945 defeat of Nazi Germany. 
Last year, 8,000 troops marched, the lowest since 2008, due to the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war. Meanwhile, North Korea celebrates its Victory Day with a parade too. It's held on July 27th. It marks the end of hostilities in the 1950-53 Korean War. Last year, Pyongyang showcased nuclear-capable missiles and new attack drones at the parade. China holds a parade each year on October 1st. It's one of the most elaborate parades one could witness. For India, it all started during the British rule. Royal parades were commonplace. They projected the British power not only to Indians, but to competing European colonial powers too. When India became a republic in 1950, it adopted the constitution, and this marked the end of India's ties to the British Empire. Now, the new republic shed many British traditions, but it decided to reclaim parades. India held a military parade to commemorate the big day. This was a symbol of India's victory over colonial rule. An indication of a new, strong, rising republic, which would not shy away from defending itself. And military parades became an expression of authority and prestige. So, be it Mesopotamia, Prussia or India, when it comes to military parades, all are in step. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. You've already seen the Republic Day celebrations here in India. We're leaving you with what happened across the globe, how India's 75th Republic Day was celebrated. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. Today's Vasant Panchmi marks the arrival of spring in India. It is also the country's 74th Republic Day. We say what better day for a new beginning. Here's a Republic Day gift from India for the BBC. A list of suggestions for the BBC for their upcoming documentaries. The Kohinoor and the Colonial Loot. An outdated monarchy and unhealthy obsession with the royals. Racism in 2023. We're waiting. This is about their religion. From the 2021 census data, it says people under 40 in England and Wales are becoming non-religious. We're starting with Turkey. The picture looks worse than it did yesterday. This is one of the deadliest natural disasters in this century. Dumb phones may be making people smarter. Study after study has shown that smartphones adversely affect our intelligence levels. Our next story is about three words and maybe some alliteration. China, Cows cloning. China is having a cloning movement. Dr. Jayashankar, India today is a bigger economy than Britain. It is a geopolitical power. It is a post-colonial country that dominates the originally English sport of cricket. Would you call it a reversal of power? I would call it rebalancing, but I would also say this is history which is switch hitting. The most popular film in India last year uh, was a film called RRR uh, and this was had to do with the British era and I'm trying to put it delicately you weren't the nice guys in the movie the failure of American banks has led to a loss of over 400 billion dollars the world over the map of our world is about to change and I'm not talking about China breaching boundaries I'm talking about the continent of Africa splitting into two it's finally happened. Imran Khan has officially been arrested. 
with a vastly loved dish, the bruschetta. Many of us call it bruschetta. It's a common mistake. Soon it would be a punishable offense. There's a hole in the ocean bed. It's off the coast of Oregon in the US and it's leaking. Some experts say it can shift up poles and wipe off Los Angeles entirely. Listen to this carefully. 14 million jobs could be eliminated in the next five years. 14 million. That's the prediction of the World Economic Forum. So employers will slash more jobs than creating new ones. And you know what will drive this change? Technology. Artificial intelligence. It will change the workplace as we know it. It will have both positive and negative impacts. It will create jobs for those who can develop and manage AI tools. It will also take away jobs like those that involve record keeping. Pardon us for an incoming Harry Potter analogy, but these expiry dates are like Dumbledore. They always know what's up. We're in Washington, D.C., the capital of the United States of America, where Prime Minister Modi will arrive for his first state visit. The White House isn't the only landmark built by slaves. Look at this. This is an ad for a gun, Glock firearms, and nowhere else have I seen something like this. They seal themselves inside a deep sea submarine. They embarked on a voyage. Now, they've gone missing. Twitter bid adieu to its iconic blue bird on Monday. Musk has now rebranded the social media platform as X. Now, America may have come up with a new idea. It wants to block sunlight from reaching the Earth. The question is, can it be effective? It was called 15 minutes of pure terror. The Vikram lander had successfully arrived on the moon. India is on the moon. Canada says they've received threats on social media. They want additional security. But what about the security of Indian diplomats in Canada? If you've been tracking the news, you know that the hype is real. It is what many call the Met Gala of diplomacy. I know diplomacy can be boring, but it's also about the grandeur, the opulence, diplomatic finesse and international flair. President De Silva, welcome to First Post. How are you doing? How do you like New Delhi? The Nigerian delegation was the first to arrive. What do birthday parties and space exploration missions have in common? Helium. In all likelihood, it is leaking out of the very core of our planet. This was one of the first sites uh, of the attack by Hamas terrorists. We were on our way to Tel Aviv and as you can see, sirens uh, sounding. Warning of a rocket attack. So Beijing has been an honest broker during Sri Lanka's financial crisis. Do you at, at some point feel that you were dealing with a loan shark? I won't say it's a loan shark. So they did make your life more difficult. Thousands of delegates from across the world will descend on this building. Expectations are low at this COP summit, which is ironic because their job is to literally save the world. My brother, Prime Minister Modi, he is efforts in championing the place of Global South and specifically the place of Africa. I have a lot of admiration for Prime Minister Modi. He believes like me in bottom up trying to do what benefits the majority of uh, citizens. In the late 1980s, the economy was in recession, the cost of raising children rose dramatically, so many of them stopped having children. They embraced the dink lifestyle, double income and no kids, D-I-N-K, double income, no kids. This is the front page of the Italian daily, Libero Quotidiano. Right above her head, the headline says, Man of the Year. It is a problematic accolade. Why Giorgia Maloney should refuse to be celebrated as Man of the Year, because leadership from men is the norm, which puts women in a bind. But if you're still wondering what's wrong with that title, just ask yourself this. Would a man accept being called Woman of the Year? I hope you have your answer.